let's get started. All right, uh, how you doing? Uh, it's pretty rough. <laughs> You're rough? You look down, what's wrong? Uh, you got some, some women problems. So do you, women or woman problems? Uh, <laughs> what do you say? Some, some women problems uh, and also some men problems. Men problems? Yeah. What are your problems? Uh, they've been saying that my beats are too fresh. You know, they're too trill and they just can't handle that. Is the say, people are saying your beats are too fresh and they can't handle it? Yeah. I've, I've, I've got to take it day by day. I'm not qualified to help you with this. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So let's talk about databases then. All right. Um, so, uh, again, quick reminder homework one is uh, due tonight. Uh, and then project one is going out today. I'll, I'll announce it at the end of the class. It's actually on the website now, and the source code is online. Uh, but I'll discuss what it is, uh, what you're required to do today. Um, and then, just like before, you'll submit this on Gradescope, uh, um, and you know, you, everything will be auto graded. All right, um, I do want to spend some time talking a little bit about OLAP workloads, is where after you've collected a bunch of data in the OLTP side, now you want to start analyzing it to extrapolate new information. Like, people in the city of Pittsburgh are more, more likely to buy this kind of product. Right, so that you can use that information to then you know, push information to the OTP side to get people to do things you want them to do. And then the hybrid transactional analytical processing, HTAP workloads, this is sort of a new buzzword that Gartner invented uh, a few years ago, basically describing these database systems that try to do uh, both of them. So a typical setup you'll see often is like this. You'll have your front-end OTP da databases, and then you have your giant back-end data warehouse. So these are sometimes called data silos because you can do a bunch of updates into the sort of one database instance, uh, whether it's a single node or distributed, it doesn't matter, but it's, a, it's a single logical database. And then uh, you apply all your changes here, but they don't really communicate with each other. Each one is, is sort of a, an island by itself. So then you're going to do what's called extract, transform, and load, or ETL. And this is sort of a, the, the term you use to describe taking data out of these front ends, cleaning it up, processing it, and then putting it to the back end data warehouse. So the example I like to give for this is like Zynga, uh, the Farmville people, they buy a lot of gaming startups. And then when they buy them, they all run their own front end OLTP databases. But then when they want to put it in their back end giant data warehouse, so they can do analyze things to make you buy crap on Farmville better, right? And so because say like in one database, the first name of a customer will be F name, another database will be you know, F first underscore name, right? So it's the same concept or same entity just with different different uh, uh, syntax and nomenclature. So this ETL process cleans all that up. You shove it to your data warehouse, you do all your analytics here, and then whatever new information you have, you push it to the front, all right? And then when you see things like people that bought this item also bought this item, that's, that they're doing that on the OLAP side, and then they shove it to the front end to expose that through the OTP application. So HTAP basically says, let's just also do some of the analytical queries that we can normally only do on the OLAP side. We can do it on the front end data silos. You still want this giant thing, your giant data warehouse, because you want to be able to, to, to look at all your data silos put, to, put together. But now, instead of waiting for things to be propagated to the back end, you can do some things on the front end. So that's basically what HTAP is. So again, this could be like your MySQL, this is your Postgres, MongoDB, whatever you want. And then your back end data warehouse would be Hadoop stuff, Spark, uh, Greenplum, Vertica, you know, those, those large enterprise data warehouse systems, or Redshift or Snowflake or other uh, cloud ones. Okay, so is this clear? Okay, so the main topic today we're gonna talk about is now, given that we've already spent uh, two previous lectures on deciding how we're actually gonna represent uh, the database in, on disk, now we wanna talk about what we actually do to bring that database from those files on disk, the pages on disk, and bring them into memory so that we can operate on them, right? So remember that we, the database system can't operate directly on disk. We can't do reads and writes without having to bring it to memory first. That, that's the von Neumann architecture. Now, there are some new hardware coming out that you can push execution logic down to the disks, but we, we can ignore that for now. So we're trying to figure out how do we want to bring that, those pages into disk, and we want to do this and be able to support a database that exceeds the amount of memory that we have. And we want to minimize the impact or the slowdown or the, imp the problems of having queries tap to touch data on disk. We want to make it appear as if everything's in memory. So another way to think of the problem is, is, is also in terms of spatial versus temporal control. So spatial control is you know, where are we physically going to write this data on disk, right? Meaning like we, we know that these pages are going to be used together often, possibly one after another. 
So when we write those pages out, we want to write them sequentially so that when we go read them again, they'll be, they'll be you know, right in, uh, physically close to each other, and we don't have to do long seeks to find different spots on disk. We also care about temporal control, and this is where we make decisions about when do we read pages into memory, like what time we do this, and then at some point we have to write it back out if it's been written if it, or if it's been modified, and we want to make a decision of when we actually go ahead and do that. And again, this is the overarching goal of can, trying to minimize the number of stalls we have because our queries try to read data that we didn't have in memory, and we had to write out, you know, that, that was out on disk, we had to go fetch it. So this is the overall architecture of the lower store manager that I showed in the beginning. So we sort of covered this part already. So we, now we know how to have a database file or files on disk. We know how to represent the page directory to find the data we need. And then we have a bunch of pages, slotted pages, log structure pages, it doesn't matter. We have a bunch of pages out on disk and we know how to jump to them to find them. So we're now we're talking about this part up here, the buffer pool, right? When something else in the system, like the execution engine, the thing executing queries comes along and says, I want to read page two. We got to know how to fetch the page directory into memory, figure out what's in there, and then go find the, the page that we want and fetch that into memory. And then the tricky thing is going to be, if we don't have enough space, don't have free memory to bring that page we need in, we have to make a decision on what page to write out. So that's, you know, th this is what we're trying to solve today. Right? And then the, the other parts of the system don't need to know or really care about what's, you know, what's in memory, what's not in memory. They're just going to wait until you get the thing that you need and then give you back a pointer to let you do whatever it is that you wanted to do. Okay? So the things we're talking about today is essentially just how to build or what a buffer pool manager actually is going to do. Uh, in some, I'm going to use the term buffer pool manager. Some systems will call this a buffer cache. It's, it's the same thing. Right? It's memory managed by, by the database system. Then we'll talk about how we actually can do uh, different policies to decide what, you know, what pages we want to write out the disk, what pages if we need to free up space, additional optimizations we can do to, to minimize this impact, and then we'll finish up talking about so other pieces of the database system that may need memory. Okay? So again, the buffer pool is essentially just a large memory region that we're going to allocate inside of our database system. We're going to call malloc, and we're going to get some chunk, chunk of memory, and that's where we're going to put all our pages that we fetch from disk. And so this is, again, this is all entirely managed by the memory, uh, by the database system, other than having go to the operating system and, and ask for the memory, right? We have to use malloc. There's, we can't just malloc or allocate memory on our own. So we, the OS is going to provide us this. But then we're going to break up this memory region into fixed size or page size chunks called frames. And this is, you know, frame seems kind of unusual. Why don't I just say page or block or whatever? But there's so many different terms in, in database systems to, to roughly describing the same thing. So frames correspond to slots in the, or see, I use the term slot, I'm gonna use that. Frames correspond to regions or chunks in the buffer pool region, memory region that we can put pages in, right? And we, slot is the thing we put things into pages within for tuples. So for buffer pool, it's, it's frames. For on the page, it'll be slots. So. What happens is when the database system calls, makes a request and say, I want a page, right? We're going to look to see whether it's already in our, in our buffer pool. If not, then we go out in the disk, make a copy of it, and fetch, fetch it in, put it into memory. So this is a straight one-to-one -one copy. We're not doing any deserialization, right? We, we can ignore compression for now, but whatever, how, however it's represented on disk is exactly how it'll be represented in memory. We're not doing any marshalling of the data. We just take, take it from the disk and put it directly into memory. All right, and we keep doing this for all, all the other pages that, that, that we may need. All right? So the, in my earlier example, when I, when I showed how the execution engine says, hey, I want a page two, right? It magically, you know, Buffer Pool Manager magically figured out what page two is. So in our, if, if we're just organizing these things as frames, uh, the pages can go in any order in the frames that they want, right? <laughs> In this case here, even though it's page one, page one, two, three, in my buffer pool, it's page one, three. It's not in the same order that it's out on disk. So we need an, an extra indirection layer above this to figure out if I want a particular page, what frame has the one I want. Because it's not going to match exactly in the same order that it is on disk. So this is what the page table is. The page table is just a hash table that's going to keep track of what pages we have in memory. And if you ask for a particular page ID, it'll tell you what frame that, it, that it's located, located in, right? And so the database system is going to have to maintain some, some additional metadata to keep track of what, what's going on with the pages that it currently has in, in its buffer pool. So the first thing we got to keep track of is called the dirty flag. And this is just a flag, a single bit, that tells us whether the page has been modified 
since it's been read from, from disk. Like, did some query, some transaction make a change to it? The other thing we got to keep track of also is uh, what we'll called a pin counter, a reference counter. And this is just keeping track of the number of threads or queries that are currently running that want this page to remain in memory. Meaning we don't, we don't want it written out to disk. Right? It could be because I'm, I'm going to update it, so I do my fetch, I go fetch the page I need, bring it to my buffer pool, then I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and modify. I don't want that page to get evicted or swapped out back to the disk in between the time it's been brought in and before I can actually do my update to it. This also is going to prevent us from evicting pages that uh, have not been safely written back to disk yet. All right. So again, so like I could pin a page and say I, I don't want this thing uh, in uh, to ever be, ever be removed from the buffer pool for now, and then say I'm reading a page here. Uh, sorry, I want to read a page that's not currently in memory. I want to put a latch on this, this entry in the hash table so that I can go fetch the page and then update the page table to not point to it, right? And I have to do this because multiple threads could be running at the same time. I can't assume that I'm the only person looking at the page table, so I want to prevent somebody else from taking this, this entry in my page table, and while I'm fetching the page that I need, they come and steal it from me and put something else in, all right? So again, there's, there's, we'll see this as we go along later in the semester, but there's a bunch of extra stuff we have to do to keep track of what pages have been modified. So the dirty bit is just sort of one piece of it. We also need to keep track of who actually made the modification. So because we, we, we want to write a log record to say, here's the change that was made, we want to make sure that log record is written first before a page is written. Right, this is another example why MMAP is a bad idea, because I can't guarantee the operating system is not going to write my page out the disk before I want it to. Because right, it doesn't, doesn't prevent you from doing that. At least on Linux, FreeBSD can let you do this, but Windows and, and Linux don't, don't let you prevent this. All right, so is this clear what we're trying to do here? Right? Basically managing our own memory, but we're keeping track of how the transactions or queries are modifying the, the pages, and we have to protect ourselves in the page table to prevent anybody else from you know, evicting things or overwriting stuff before we're done with, uh, with what we wanted to do. Any questions? So, I need to make a very important distinction now about the difference between locks and latches. So this will come up later on. This, you'll have to do this for the first project as well. Um, if you're coming from an operating system background, in, in their world, a lock is what we call a latch. So in, in, in the, uh, uh, let me just try both of them in the context of databases, and I'll, see, I'll describe how they map into the OS world. So a lock in, data, in the database world is some higher level logical primitive that's going to protect the contents of the database, the logical contents, like a tuple, a table, a database. Right? And the transaction is going to hold this lock for its duration while it's running, which means it could, could be multiple queries. Right? This could be you know, multiple milliseconds or multiple seconds even, or even, even minutes or hours as if, if it's a really long running query. So in that world, again, this is something that the database system is going to provide to us and expose to uh, you as like the application programmer. You, you can see what locks are being held for as you run queries. Latches are the low-level protection primitives that we use for the critical sections of the internals of the database system, like protecting, uh, protecting data structure, protecting regions of memory. And so for these, these latches we're going to hold for just the duration of the operation that we're making. Like if I go update my page table, I take a latch on the entry on, on the, the, the the location of that I'm going to modify, make the change, and then I release the latch. All right, and we're not, we don't need to worry about rolling back any changes in the same way we do for, for locks because it's, you know, it's, it's an internal thing, like updating the physical data structure of the database system, I make the change, and if I can't actually get the latch that I want, then I just abort and, and don't worry about rolling back. Yes? What does rolling back mean in this context? Okay, so he says rolling back changes. This will come later on when we talk about currency control, but basically say like, um, I want to take money out of my bank account and put it in your bank account. So we take money out of my bank account, but then the system crashes before I put the money in your account. I want to roll back the change I made to my account because I don't want to lose that money. That's what I mean by that. All right, this, we'll, we'll discuss the whole lecture on concurrency control. It's awesome, trust me. Uh, but for now, the main thing, we're focused on this thing here, right? So again, in the operating system world, this would, a latch would be something like a mutex. We're actually going to use mutexes in, in our database system to protect the critical sections of things. So I will try to be very careful and always say latch when I mean latch, but occasionally I slip up and we'll use lock. But I, if it's, a, it's an internal thing, we mean latch. 
It's also very confusing too, because the mutex implementation you would use to protect you for his latch is called a spin lock, right? But it's really, you know, this thing and not this thing. Okay? All right. So the other distinction we want to make is the difference between the page directory and the page table. So remember, the page directory is what we're going to use to figure out where to find pages in our file. So we want page one, two, three. It'll tell us what file at what offset or you know, what, what set of files have, have what we're looking for. So all the changes we're going to make to the page directory have to be durable. They have to be written back to the disk because if we crash and come back, we want to know where to find the pages that we have. The page table is an internal in-memory map that just maps page IDs to where the, the frames that they are in, in the buffer pool. So this thing can be entirely ephemeral, and we don't need to back it by disk because if we crash and come back, our buffer pool is blown away anyway, so who cares? So this, the, the page directory has to be durable. The, the, the page table does not, does not have to be. And that means we can just use whatever your favorite hash map or hash table implementation you want. Right? For project one, you just use STD, STD map. That's fine. Because, uh, again, we don't have to worry about this thing being uh, durable. We have to make sure it's thread safe, certainly but not, not durable. All right, so now when we start talking about how we want to allocate memory in our database uh, for the buffer pool, we, will, we can start to think about this in, in two different ways. So the first is that we can choose what are called sort of global policies, where we're trying to make decisions that benefit the entire workload that we're trying to, try, trying to execute. Right, we look at all the queries, all the transactions that are going on in the system, and we try to say, at this point in time, what's the right thing I should do for choosing what should, should be in memory versus not in memory? An alternative is to use a local policy, where on, for each single query or each single transaction we're running, we try to say, what's the best thing to do to make my one query or one transaction go faster, even though for the, for the, uh, the global system, that actually might be a bad, a bad choice. So, the, there's no one way that's better than another. Obviously, there's optimization you, you can do if you have a global view versus a local view, but then for each individual query, you might be, be more tailored to what they want to do to make that run faster. So as we've seen in much of these th examples as we go along for optimizations, the most systems will probably try to do a combination of the two of them. What you'll be implementing for the first project will, will be, is considered a global policy because it's just looking at you know, what's the least recently used page and, and removing that even though that may be bad for one particular query. All right, so that's basically all you really need to know about how to build a buffer pool, right? It's just you have a page table that maps page IDs to frames, and then you look in the, the offset in your in the, the, the allocated memory, and that tells you that here's the page that you were looking for. Seems pretty simple, right? So now we want to talk about how to actually make this thing be super awesome or super uh, tailored for the application that, that we're trying to run or the workload we're trying to run inside of our database system. And this is going to allow us to do certain things that the operating system can't do because it doesn't know anything about what kind of queries you're running. It doesn't know what data they're touching, what are they going to touch next, right? So now we can talk about what we can do to make, make this thing do better than what sort of a naive scheme would do. So let's talk about how to handle multiple buffer pools, prefetching, scan sharing, and then the, the last one would be buffer pool bypass. Okay. So in my example that I showed, I referred to the buffer pool as a single entity. Right, the data system has one buffer pool. In actuality, you can have multiple buffer pools. So you can have multiple regions of memory you've allocated. They each have their own page table. They each have their own then mapping to, uh, from page IDs to, to frame IDs or frames. All right? And the reason why you want to do this is now you can have, for each buffer pool, you can actually have you know, the, the, a local policy for that buffer pool that's tailored for whatever is the data that you're putting into it. You know, so, for example, I could have a... Uh, a single buffer pool for each table. Because maybe some tables I'm doing a bunch of sequential scans, and some tables I'm doing uh, point queries, I'm jumping to single pages at a time. And I can have different caching policies or different replacement policies to decide based on the two workload types. But I can't do that easily if it's a giant, just a giant a buffer pool. Well, let's say I, have an, I can have a buffer pool for an index, a buffer pool for tables, and then they have different access patterns, and then I can have different policies for each of those. The other big advantage you also get is that it's going to end up reducing latch contention for the different threads that are trying to access it, right? So when I do that lookup in the page table, I have to take a latch on the entry that I'm looking at as I go find the, the frame that has the data that I want, and I want to make sure that nobody else swaps that out, what, but, you know, 
from the time I do the lookup from the time I go get the, the page that I want. And so that means that I could have a bunch of threads all contending on the same latch that could they're all accessing the same page table. So no matter how many cores I have on my brand new machine, I'm not getting uh, good scalability because everything's contended on, on, on these, uh, these critical sections. But now if I just have multiple page tables, each thread, you know, they could be accessing different page, table, different page tables at the same time, and therefore they're not contending on those latches, and now I get better scalability. Now, it still could be still bottlenecked on the disk speed, which is always a big problem, but at least internally now, I'm not worried about them, you know, trying to all acquire the same latch. So, this is something you see mostly in the enterprise or expensive database systems. So, Oracle DB2, Sybase, and Formix, uh, uh, SQL Server, all support this ability to have multiple buffer pools. DB2, you can do all sorts of crazy things. You can create multiple, multiple buffer pools. You can assign them to different tables. You can have different caching policies for all, for all of them. You can set them to be different, different page sizes. Um, MySQL, even though it's open source, actually has this as well. It's, it's not that as sophisticated. You just say uh, how many buffer pool instances you want, and then they just do round robin hashing to decide what, what uh, you know, if you forgive in page ID, where, where, where is the data that I'm looking for? What buffer pool has it? So there's two ways to, to use these things, right? To, to map the thing that you're looking for to a buffer pool that has the page that, uh, that you want. Right? So typically what happens is if you have multiple buffer pools, you can't have a page in one, you know, in, in buffer pool one this time, and then when you fetch it back the disk later on, it comes in another one. It always wants to be in the same location, so you know how, you know how to find it quickly. So the first approach is that you can actually extend the record ID to now include additional metadata about what database object this buffer pool is managing. So if you recall, when we looked at the uh, record IDs of, of, of Oracle and SQL Server, they had extra columns, extra information that Postgres didn't have. Like Postgres had the page and the slot number. Oracle had like the, the object number, page number, and, and then a slot number. So we could use that, that additional object number to then have another map that says, all right, for object you know, XYZ, you can, it's, in this, it's in this buffer pool or that buffer pool. Right, so now the requests from, from upper levels of the system are saying, give me, you know, give me record one, two, three, and I know how to, how to split that up and find out the, what object it corresponds to and what buffer pool will maintain that data. For the hashing approach, again, I think this is what MySQL does. It's pretty simple. You just take the record ID, you hash it and mod n by the number of, of buffer pools you have, and that just tells you where, where, where to go get the data that you want. Right, and this, you can do this really, really quickly, really fast. It's not an expensive operation. Actually, for either of those, it's not an expensive operation. All right, the next optimization we can do is to do prefetching. So the idea here is that, again, we want to minimize the stalls in the data system due to having to go to disk to read data. So if we start doing like a scan and our buffer pool is empty, this query wants to read page zero. Page zero is not in memory, not in our buffer pool. So we have to stall that thread until we go out the disk, fetch it, and then put it into our buffer pool. Then when, once it's in our buffer pool, then we hand back the pointer to the upper levels of the system and say, the page you wanted is now here in, in, our, in our memory. Go do whatever it is that you want to do. So the way to think about this is like, it's a, you can th th think of this arrow as like a cursor. So internally, the database system is going to keep track of uh, this, this thing called a cursor. Like As you iterate over every single page for, that your query needs, you just know where you left off the last time. So when you go back and say, give me the next page, it you know, doesn't start from the beginning. It jumps where you, where you left off. So in this case here, I get page zero, I'm done. All right now I start reading page one, same thing. I have to stall because it's not in memory. The disk goes and gets it, we put it on our buffer pool, and then once I have that, now I, can, uh, now I can proceed operating it on it. So let's say this query here wants to scan the entire table. Right? These are, for our table here, here's all the pages. So at this point, the data system could probably recognize, oh, I know you're going to end up scanning the entire table, so rather than just wait, me waiting for you to ask for each page one after another, let me go ahead and jump ahead and say, oh, I think you're also going to need page two and three. So let me go prefetch that for you, put into the buffer pool. So by the time you finish processing page one, and now you go ask me for page two or page three, it's already there. Now you don't have a stall. And again, based on how I laid out these pages on disk, and that might have been a sequential read, which, which is super fast. So by prefetching things ahead of time, I, you know, I'm minimizing the amount of random I.O. that I'm doing. 
right? So then I just keep going this down and, and prefetch everything. So that, again, that minimizes the impact of, of these distals. So this example is pretty simple, right? The, the operating system actually can figure this out too. Now, and, and, and MMAP will actually do this for you, right? So in MMAP, it, you can pass a flag and say, I'm going to do a sequential read on these pages on disk, and it'll go ahead and prefetch a bunch of them ahead of time. And so again, that, that will minimize the stalls having, because you had to read something from disk. So MMAP can figure this out without even knowing anything about what the query is trying to do. Right? The data system knows what the query wants to do, and it can go prefetch ahead of time. But now there's going to be some queries where the operating system is not going to be able to know what to do, but we do in the database system because we know what the query wants. So, you, so an example of this would be like an index scan. So let's say I want to do a scan on this table, and I want to get all the values. Uh, I want to find all the tuples where the value is between 100 and 250. So now let's say that I have an index on that value. And I've explained what an index is. Just think of this as like a, a glossary in, in your textbook that allows you to jump to a particular page that has the data that you want. Right? So it's a, instead of just doing a sequential scan, I can just jump through the index and find exactly what I'm looking for. So let's say that our, in our index pages, right, we know ahead of time what the ranges are. So when my query starts to do that scan, I always got to read the first page for the index because that's the root. Right? So I, you know, I have to jump to there. But now I'm going to do a lookup and say, well, I'm looking for my query was between 100 and 250. So I know that all the pages I need, the values I want where it's greater than or equal to 100, are going to start on this side of the tree. So now I'm going to jump down into page one and read that. Right? That's still sequential at this point. So again, the operating system could probably figure this out. But now I'm going to branch and go down here. And I'm going to scan across the leaf nodes. But this is index page three, index page five. They're not contiguous with each other on, on disk. And so the operating system may try to end up prefetching page two and page three, but I don't need page two, that's wasted. And I need page five and I didn't prefetch that. So because we know what the query is gonna do, we can go ahead and prefetch exactly the pages that we want and bring them into our buffer pool uh, because we, again, we understand what the, what, what, what's actually the context what are the context of the query, and what are these pages actually representing? Because the operating system just sees pages. It doesn't know what's in them. But we know, because we wrote this code, we know that these are index pages, and they're connected together in some way, so we know how to do this traversal. So this doesn't come for free, right? There's some extra metadata we have to keep track of in these pages to say, like, here's the sibling, here's my starting point, or my endpoint, here's his starting point. So I know whether I'm going to scan across over here. And actually, I can't know whether I need five before I look at three, so, you know, this, this, I'm not saying this is like super easy to do, but you can kind of see again how we may not be jumping exactly through the, the pages sequentially in a way that the operating system is not going to be able to find. So again, this, 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 to me, this is the classic example of what we can do in our database system that the operating system cannot do. Because it doesn't, doesn't know about what's in the data, it just sees a bunch of reads and writes. All right, the next optimization we can do is called scan sharing. So the idea here is that we can have queries piggyback off each other and reuse the data that, there, that one query is reading from disk and use that for its query. So this is different than, than result caching. Result caching is, you say, I run exactly the same query, and I compute some answer, and I cache that result. So that same query shows up again. I can just, rather than rerunning the query, I just give you the answer I had before. This is at a lower level, at the buffer manager and the storage layer, where we're now again just have this cursor accessing pages, we can then reuse the pages we're, we're getting out from one thread for another thread. So, the way it's going to work is that we're going to allow multiple queries to attach to a single cursor that's scanning through our pages and putting them to the buffer pool. It's almost like a pub sub thing where we say, I want to know whether you get a new page, and then you can notify whatever thread that may be waiting for it, even though they're not the one that actually did the read. So, depending on the implementation, the queries do not need to be exactly the same. Typically, in result caching, they do. In our, in our world here, they don't have to be. Just, I need to know whether I'm reading the same pages. And then in some cases, too, also, if they're computing the, a similar result, we could share those intermediate results and across different threads. It's almost like a, it's called a materialized view. We'll cover this later in the semester. But for our purposes here, we're just, again, we're just looking at uh, page accesses. So again, the way it works is that if a query starts a scan, and then it, re it recognizes that there's another uh, query also doing the same scan. 
it just attaches itself to, to the first guy's cursor. And then as it gets pages, we get notified that that page came in and we, we, can, we can access it as well. So the important thing to know is that we have to keep track of where the second query came along, sort of got on the train for the cursor, so that we know if the cursor ends for the first query, there may be other data we have to go back and read. Right, so we can, if, if we want to look at everything, we start halfway, we want, we want to know where we started so we can come back and see the rest. So as far as I know, this technique is, is fully supported only in DB2 and SQL Server. It's super hard to get correct. Right, it seems like kind of trivial, but it, it can get pretty gnar gnarly based on what the, the query is doing. Oracle supports has a basic uh, scare shanning they call cursor sharing, and, but it only works if you have two exact queries running at the exact same time. Whereas these guys can extrapolate based on the query that, oh, I, need, I know you're reading this table, I need to read the same thing and jump on it. This thing has to say, I have two queries that are doing the exact same thing. So let's look at an example. So say we have our first query here, it's computing the sum on A. So the, quer the, qu the query's cursor is going to start, and it's just going to start scanning through uh, the table, looking at each page. Right? So now let's say at this point here, it wants to read page 3. We don't have any, a free frame in our buffer pool, so we run our replacement policy algorithm to decide which of these pages we want to remove. In this case here, we'll do something civil and say, well, page 0 was the last pa the, 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 the page that was the oldest since I've accessed it. So let me go ahead and replace that with page 3. And then now I continue scanning. But now let's say after this happens, after we swap out page 0 with page 3, a second query shows up that also wants to do a sequential scan on this table. So without scan sharing, it'll just start at the beginning, like the first guy, and just scan all the way down. But this is actually the worst thing for us because the first thing it's going to read is page 0, but we just threw that out on disk. So now we can end up thrashing because this guy can't proceed until page zero is, is in. So we, this is going to, you know, it has to stall and to go fetch it back in. But I, I just had it in memory, but I got rid of it. So that's bad. So with scan sharing, this guy just hops along for the ride and reads the same thing that Q1 reads. And, you know, produces and computes whatever intermediate result it needs for that part of, part of the data it's looking at. So now at this point, Q1 is done. So its cursor goes away. And then Q2 starts over at the beginning and knows, knows that, oh, I started when you were reading page 3, so this is how long I need to scan down until I get my final result. Yes? The part of the memory, like, where these queries store their data, like, where they are processing, they must also need some memory for storing their data, right? So that is separate from the buffer. This question is, um, each query is computing, I'll say, intermediate results as, as it reads this datum. So they also now need a memory region to, to put this data in that's separate from this buffer pool. Yes. So we'll see this in an example on Postgres in, in a second. But the, typically, that memory will also be backed by a buffer pool. Right? And because, like, if I end up computing something, you know, say I'm computing a join, and the output of that join operator doesn't fit in memory, I need to be able to, to start evicting those pages out to disk. So, so any ephemeral memory like that would still be backed by a buffer pool. But whether it's in the global buffer pool, whether it's a private one for the query, it depends on the implementation. But we don't need to bring pages from the disk for that buffer pool, right? His question statement is, I don't need to bring, I don't need to bring pages from disk in for that query intermediate result buffer pool. I'm still in unless we're storing because it's too big. Yeah, and let, yeah, so as I'm writing data, like so this guy, and this is a trivial table because the average is it's, it's a scalar, right? But let's say this is you know some really complex co computation. As I'm generating, as I'm scanning this data, I'm updating my intermediate result, I may overflow memory and those get swapped out to disk. So I'm writing to memory and then they would just get, get written out to disk as needed. But it's not like I would read for my query yeah, it doesn't make sense because like, anything you need to read from like the low-level database pages, you're going to put in the buffer pool that everyone can see, right? So again, this is another good point. This is the shared data structure, right? So, it did, like Q1 is is was reading pages uh, and putting it into the buffer pool. Any other thread that needed these pages is allowed to go go ahead and read it, right? The pin latch, the pin that just tells you that hey, don't swap this out the disk. The doesn't doesn't prevent anybody else from reading it at the same time you are. There's higher level things like the locks that keep track of what pages you're allowed to read and write from, 
or what, what, you know, with database objects. This is the pin just basically says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm operating on this, don't swap it out. So that, that answers your question. Okay. So this is another good example of what's awesome about the relational model. Because the relational model is unordered. Meaning like, it doesn't, like, I can actually have Q2 start anywhere for some queries, and the answer I'm gonna produce may be different from based on when I execute it, but it's still considered correct. So if I change this query to put compute the average and I limit it to 100, meaning I only want to compute the average of 100 tuples, it doesn't specify that I, I can only, I have to look at the first 100 tuples. So I could start here at page three with my, with my uh, scan sharing on this cursor and see the first 100 tuples in these first three pages, and then that's, a, that's enough for me to compute the result. If I started now at the beginning, I may actually get a different result. But according to the relational model, that's still fine. Because the database is unordered. Yes? Is it equally valid if we just read through whatever non-sequential pages have to be at that time? Yeah, so perfect. So he says, would it also still be valid if we, rather than having the cursor say, all right, well, let's go look in my disk page and start fetching them. What if I go check in the buffer pool and figure out what's actually in memory and compute the aggregation of this particular query with, with what's in memory? Absolutely, yes. And the smarter systems can do that. Again, it doesn't matter, right? It's in memory. Uh, as long as I see 100 tuples, then that, this query is still correct. Now, this is we don't like. You wouldn't want to write this, but uh, it's you know it's still valid. All right. the The last optimization I want to talk about is the buffer pool bypass. So. It's sort of related to his question before about like the intermediate result memory. But let's say that I have some queries where we're doing sequential scans and the I don't want to pay the penalty of having to go look up in the page table and look in my buffer pool to go figure out whether the page I'm looking for is in memory. And furthermore, I also don't want to pollute the cache with maybe reading some data that I'm not going to need in the near future. So the the, the, with buffer pool bypass or buffer cache bypass, depending on what system it, it is, the idea is that you allocate a small amount of memory to, the, to, to your, your query, to the thread running it, and then as it reads pages from disk, right, if it's not in the buffer pool, it has to go to disk to get it. Rather than putting it in the buffer pool, it just puts it in its local memory. And then when the query is done, all that just gets dropped and thrown away. All right. And you do this again because you want to avoid the overhead of going to the page table, which is, you know, it's a hash table with latches. It's not, it's, not, it's not super expensive, but it's not free. It's not cheap. So in Formex, these are called light scans, but pretty much every single, again, major database system uh, supports something like this. I don't, know, I don't know whether MySQL 8 does. I don't think 5.7 does. Um, and then, again, if you recognize, the, you, know, you only really want to do this if you know the intimate result or the thing you're scanning is not, not huge. If, if you're doing a sort that's going to be, you know, terabytes of memory, then you want to be backed by the buffer pool because that thing can, can, can page up the disk as needed. All right, the last thing to sort of understand also, too, is what's actually going on below the database system. What's happening as we read pages uh, from the operating system? What is the operating system actually doing? So, again, all our disk operations are going to be going through the OS API, at the lowest level, like F open, F read, F write. Uh, you know, we're not going to access the raw, raw disk themselves. So because we're now going through the operating system, by default, the operating system is going to maintain its own separate cache for the file system. All right, this is called the OS page cache. So that means, that again, as I read a page from, from disk, the OS is going to keep a cap copy of it in its file system cache or OS page cache, and then I'll have another copy of it in, in my buffer pool. So... Most database systems do not want, to do, want you to do this. Do not want the operating system to do this. So when you open a file, you pass in the, the POSIX flag O direct or direct IO, where you have the OS not do any of that uh, caching itself, and you manage what's in memory uh, on your own. So pretty much every single database system, when you go read the manual, they will tell you that make sure you can actually you know, turn this on. The only database system that does this is uh, it's Postgres, as far as you know. The only major database system that relies on the OS page cache is Postgres. And so the reason they said they do this is because they claim that from an engineering standpoint, it's one less additional caching thing they have to manage. 
Right? It still has their own buffer pool, but it's not going to be as big. It's not going to use all the memory on the system like MySQL or, 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 or Oracle would use. They're going to let the OS do some additional management themselves. So from an engineering perspective, it's less overhead on their part from actually maintaining that, that piece of the system. And it's a minor performance penalty to, to rely on this, which you'll see in a second. Okay? So I like using Postgres for, for demos um, because it's almost like a textbook implementation of, of a database system. And you, it actually exposes a lot of the you know, important concepts that we're talking about pretty, pretty easily. Let me call it here. Okay. All right, so this is running, again, a machine back in the lab. Um, let me turn on the lights. And I type on this laptop because it's a pain to type on the on the surface. I hate the keyboard. All right. So this is running. This is just running HTOP. It's a better version of top. And the thing I want to I want to focus on is is the memory you should stuff up here. So the green bars are telling you what's the resident set size of the processes running on the, on this machine, right? It's the the memory they've malloced. The, the orange bar here, that's the file system page cache. That's the operating system's page cache. So again, as whatever processes are running on this machine, as they go read, uh, if they're not using direct I.O., if they go read a, a, a page or from a file, the OS is also going to cache it as well. So we, we can blow this all away. So in, this is running on Linux. So in Linux, we can do a... Um, That's that. Oh, four, sorry. So we can run this command um, that we basically, we pass up, we, we sync the OS, the file system cache, and we pass this flag uh, three into the proc file system to allow us to force the operating system to flush our page cache. So now if we go back and look at HTOP, now we see that the, the, the total amount of memory being used by the machine went down to three gigs, right? It's had 32 gigs before, but now it's down to three gigs. So we blew away the file system cache entirely. Okay? So now let's go, uh, let's go bring up po uh, Postgres. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, is restart it. And so by restarting it, we're going to blow away its, um, its, its buffer pool. All right, so now, bring this up, and then reconnect. We'll turn on timing, and then we'll turn off the, the parallel threads. So we're going to use that same table I showed from last class, 10 million entries of a bunch of decimals. So we can run this query. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use explain again, but I'm going to pass in analyze, two flags, analyze and buffers. So analyze, again, is going to actually run the query and also show you the query plan, what happened. This buffers flag is going to tell you how much data it read from disk. What, what percentage of the, of the pages it was reading were in the buffer pool versus on, on disk. And so because we blew away the file system cache, we blew away the buffer pool because we restarted the database system, it should, it, the hit should be zero. Right? And you see that. It said that uh, for the buffer pool, it had to read 400, 4, 444, 248 pages. Uh, you had to read the table from disk, and it took uh, 1,300 milliseconds, 1 1.3 seconds. So if I run the same query again, now you see it says that the hit was 32. So it was able to read 32 pages uh, that were already in the puffer pool, um, and then the rest it had to then read from disk. All right, and the reason why it wasn't all the pages is because Postgres maintains a, a, a buffer pool, sort of a small buffer pool ring per query, that's 32 pages. So for this one, it was allowed to read 32 pages from the last time it ran. If I run this again, it should go, to, I think, to 64. Yes, so it keeps growing in size as I'm executing the queries over and over again because it recognizes that, oh, the, the data that I need is, is, uh, is not my buffer pool. Let me increase the size of, of its cache. All right, so now what we can do is we can force the database system to put everything in, into, into memory. So they have this extension in Postgres that comes by default when, when, you, when you install it called pgwarm. 
And all this does is that we're, it's a function that we invoke on the data system to say, hey, go take all the pages for this, this table and bring it to our buffer pool. Right? And it tells you that I ran, I did that, and I read uh, 44,248 pages. Remember when I ran the query the first time, the, it, it said it had to read 4,428 pages from disk, because it's, it's getting exactly, you know, that's the, the number of pages for this table. But those 64 pages were already there. He says those 64 pages are already there, right? So this is like forcing to just read everything. And actually, I think those 64 pages might have been... Yeah, I think it doesn't look to see what's in memory. It just says, I'm going to get everything. Because if I do it again, it should give me the same number. Yeah, it just reads everything. All right, so now, if I go and run that query again, uh, I'm doing a little bit better. My hit is 16,000. 16, again, 16,000 pages I needed were in memory. So I hit, hit, had it hit in the buffer pool. But I still had to read a bunch from disk. Let me take a guess why. Yes? It's still loading everything into the buffer pool. He's, well, why is it still loading everything into the buffer pool? Depends on the size of the buffer pool, right? So we can do this in Postgres. So Postgres has a flag called shared uh, buffers. And it tells me that it's currently set to 128 megabytes. Right? But the size was what? 4428? Four, 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 so select. You can use, again, you can, I love databases. You can, you can use them as a calculator. So 4428 times 8. Um, oh, divided by or 1024, that'll give me megabytes. So the size of my table I'm reading is 345 megabytes. So again, the shared buffer is 128, but my size of my table is 345. So I can go to the Postgres configuration, in theory, four. Um, this is Postgres 11. And then go find, um, that particular parameter, and lo and behold, it's 128 megabytes. So let me set it to, let's be generous, let's say 360 megabytes, right? So now we will restart Postgres. We will blow away our file system cache from the, from the operating system, because again, as, as we read that page in, actually we go back to HTOP, um, it got, I mean, it's hard to see, it got a little bit bigger. Like you can see there's one bar there because that's, 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 that's our table we were reading in. So let me go blow away the file system cache. Um, and now I go back to Postgres. I need to reconnect, um, turn on timing, set that to this, turn off parallel threads, check to see that shared buffers is now Oh, I'm an idiot, right? Sorry. It's server 10, client 11. Too many Postgres installations, sorry. So we go back here, it's this. Put it back to 128. I said what, 360? Now we start Postgres. Go back here, reconnect, 360. Okay, good. Turn on timing, turn on parallel threads, uh, pre-warm. We had 4428248 pages, and now I run that query again. And now my hit is 44248. So I gave the data system the right amount of memory, I pre-fetched pre everything, and now everything is hitting the buffer pool. I didn't, have to, I didn't have to touch a disk at all for this particular query. I do every lookup, every page I'm, I need to access, I'm going looking in that, in that page table and finding the page, the page reference in, in a frame, but everything's in memory here. So how can we prove that the, that the database system Postgres is using, relying on the file system cache? So let's turn off, just explain everything here. Let's just see how long it actually takes. All right, it's actually, so the first time, uh, it was 1250. And it got a little faster, and then it's 733. 
right? So it takes roughly 700 milliseconds. So what we can do is go restart Postgres. Um, and then that blows away the buffer pool. And now if I come back and reconnect to Postgres, which I think I need to, yep. So now I'm, now I'm reconnected. I set the good turn on timing, turn off parallel threads. I run that same query. Before when everything was out on disk, I think it took uh, 1.3 seconds. So this one, and then with, with everything's in the buffer pool, it took 700 milliseconds. So this one should be roughly a little bit, oh. Oh, timing was off, sorry. Well, that ruined the demo, fuck. So go back, I go back to this, restart this, go back to this, reconnect, timing is on, now it's on, yeah, yeah I got it. <laughs> Parallel threads are off. Again, so I'm gonna run this query, I, blew, I restart the, the database system, that blows away the buffer pool, but the operating system still has its, its file system cache. So now if I run this query, we're going to have a bunch of buffer pool misses uh, because nothing is in memory, but it's still not going to take the full time. Right? It took 800 milliseconds instead of, instead of 1.3 seconds because the data that it needed was in the file system cache. If I run this again, I should get now 700 milliseconds. No. <laughs> there it goes. Let's go figure out what happened. Still reading data from disk. Why is that? Well, it's still running fast, even though, although that time, I think it's because that time's slower because I think it's running explain analyze. Um, It'll slowly get faster as it increases the cache size for that for that uh, query. So I think I think it's a query cache thing rather than the global thing. But again, the main takeaway we showed is that we had to give it the data system enough memory, we put everything into our buffer pool, uh, and then we were able to get the the, the full speed performance. All right, so any questions? Yes. You pre warm twice, and the second time you pre warm it's like thirty percent faster. Like why is that? I pre warm twice. What do you mean? Like you ran pre warm and then you. Oh, again. that's the file system cache. Okay. That's the, that's the OS cache. Question, yes? So uh, the first time when you put uh, the entire table in the buffer pool, uh, yes. it showed that the uh, entire 44,000 uh, rows were put, put in the buffer pool. Yes. But when we tried to read it, uh, like it like the hit was just 16,000. Uh, like since everything was in the buffer pool, like what was So the, the very first time I did this, the, the buffer pool size was 128 megabytes. The table size is 345 megabytes. Right, so how did it put everything in the buffer pool then? It didn't. That's why I had, uh, I had still had lookups in the read from disk. But it said 44,000 already, right? At the very beginning? Yeah. Oh. This is not where we're spending all our time, but this is, this is walkthrough. All right, so let's do this. Go back. We're going to blow away the, the file system cache, restart Postgres. Gonna, now we go look in, in, in our, um, I mean, that, that, that bar is not attributable potentially for, uh, for Postgres. Like, there's other things running on the, on the system. But I blew away the file system cache. I restarted Postgres. Now there's nothing in memory. So I go back to Postgres. Need to reconnect, turn off parallel threads. And so if I run the query now the first time, Right, nothing's in memory. I had to read forty-four thousand pages. Okay, so that's expected. I, pre warm tells the database system to go read everything that's on disk for that table, bring it to my buffer pool. Yeah, exactly. Like entire forty-four thousand. All forty-four thousand pages. Yes, I can do this again. Right, it read forty-four thousand pages. Now I run the same query. And now my hit is exactly 44,000. Hit means I, it hit was hit. I, the thing I was looking for was found in the buffer pool. So I forced the data system to bring everything back into memory. 
In the first example, I, I only had 128 megabytes, so I couldn't put everything in. Yes? Yes. Great. So our question is, so I said in the beginning that, that Postgres is the only system that, that does, the only major system that relies on the OS page cache. Why doesn't everybody else do this? Well, because now I'm going to have two copies of every single page potentially. So I could have a page in the OS page cache, then I'm going to have a copy of that page in my, my buffer pool. Because now if I modify that page, now it's not an exact copy anymore. So the OS has the old one and I have the new one. So it's, it's redundant data. So you're more efficient in terms of memory usage if you manage everything yourself. Furthermore, too, uh, you know, th th think of like in, in different database systems, I mean, you, most data systems support Linux now, right? But like the major ones, they got to support Windows, BSD, all these different operating systems where the OS page cache may have different performance implications or different policies. And so to guarantee consistent performance or consistent behavior across different OSs, you just manage everything yourself. That's a good question. Yes? This hit number, is it the number of tuples that were hit? Or? This is the number of pages. But right, again, so like I, it's it, Postgres is eight kilobyte pages. Oh. I take this number, multiply it eight, divide by 1024. That tells me the number of megabytes of my, my thing. I set my buffer pool size to that size, and then I can guarantee everything fits. Yes? How does the Postgres uh, buffer pool interact with OS cache? The question is, how does the OS bu buffer pool interact with the OS page cache? Yeah. Again, the, it's like... It's like a different, like different options that you can go um, if cache from the, uh, into the OS cache program and put it into the uh, buffer pool. The question is, like, are there different options of how to use it? No, like so, they, like they, it's transparent to the the program. Like I call read f read to go read a page from from the from disk. If the OS has it in the page cache, it serves me that page. Otherwise, it goes out and disk and gets it. That's all transparent to me. If I pass that flag direct I/O, that tells the operating system do not cache anything, and it's always going to go to disk and get it. So the, so the OS cache is in between the disk and the debugger. It's quite, yes, statement is the OS page cache is in between the, the sort of the disk and the data and the database. Absolutely, yes. It's going to matter also too a lot when we start doing writes. If you call like you open, you write a C program, you call F write. Does is the operating system actually going to write that right away? No, it puts it in the page cache, and at some later point, the disk scheduler says, "All right, let me let me go write this out." It's only when I call F sync when, when is when it actually gets written. But if I want to complete control of how I'm writing everything out the disk, I want to use direct I/O, and most database systems do that. Yes. When you had buffer pool of 128 uh, MB, right? Yeah. So you brought all the 380 MB, 360 MB into the buffer pool. So what would have happened? The first 128 MB would have been overwritten. Now when you did the query, you got hit. But when you started the query, you have started from the starting. So you shouldn't have got hit. Because the memory present was the later 128 MB present. Let's, let's, I mean, I want to get through the, the thing for the project. But let's let, we we'll talk about it afterwards, okay? All right. So the thing I want to talk about now quickly is the buffer replacement policy. So again, we talked about how all right we, we how to find the page we want based on the page ID and the page table. But now you know in all my examples we had enough memory mostly, and so now we want to talk about what happens if I need to bring a page in and I don't have space for it. What do I do? So the things we're going to care about in a replacement policy are obviously correctness. Right? We don't want to write out data or evict data that, that someone pinned before they're actually done with it. We want to care about accuracy because we want to make sure that we, we evict pages that are very unlikely to be used in the future so we minimize the number of disk seeks we have. We want our replacement policy to be fast because we don't, you know, as we're doing a lookup in the page table, we're holding latches and we don't want to have to run some MD complete algorithm to figure out what page to evict because right? that may take longer than actually reading the page anyway. And of course, obviously, we don't want to have a lot of metadata overhead of keeping track of all this additional data. Like we don't want to have the metadata for a page to keep track of how, how likely it's going to be used uh, to be larger than the page itself. So these replacement policies, again, are, as another good example of what distinguishes between the high-end, very expensive enterprise databases and the open source guys. Because the high-end ones have very sophisticated re uh, replacement policies. They track statistics of how pages are being used. They try to extrapolate from what the queries are actually doing and to try to make the best decision.
Whereas in the, the open source guys, or the, 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 the newer systems, not saying they're bad, but they don't have you know, millions of dollars and, and, and decades spent trying to make this thing run fast as possible. And so you know, they'll do something more simple, which is what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, this is like one of the oldest problems in CS. Like everybody and their uncle has a paper uh, in, over the years on how to do caching and things like that. I have one, right? Like this is, this is like one of the oldest problems in computer science. And so there's a, there's a ton, a, lo a long history of this. All right, so the easiest technique to use, and pretty much everyone does the first time, is LRU, or least recently used. So all we do, do here is just keep track of a timestamp of when a, the last time a page was accessed, and then when we have to go figure out what page to go evict, we just look to see which, which page has that, the oldest timestamp, and that's the one we go ahead and remove. So the way to speed this up, instead of just keeping a track of, of a, uh, you know, a timestamp per page, because then we have to do a sequential scan across all our pages in the buffer pool to figure out which one has the lowest timestamp, we can just maintain a separate data structure, like a queue, that, that are, that's sorted by the, their, their timestamps. So anytime somebody reads and writes a page, uh, we just pull it out of the queue and put it back to the end, because right? it's a first in, first out. What you guys will have to implement in, in the project is an approximation of LRU called clock. Actually, quick show of hands, who, who here has heard of clock before? Nobody, awesome, okay. Who here is, I mean, LRU, everyone should know, right? Okay, good. So clock, so LRU is, is an exact least recently used. Clock is an approximation of this, where you don't have to track the timestamp exactly every, for every single uh, page. So instead, we're all, the only information we need to keep track of is a single reference bit per page that tells you whether that page was accessed since the last time you checked it. So you're gonna organize your pages in a circular buffer, like a clock, and then you have a clock hand that goes around and does sweeps and checks to see whether that reference bit is set to one or zero, and if it's set to zero, then you know it hasn't been accessed since the last time you checked it, and therefore it can be evicted. All right? so say I have page, uh, pages one, two, three, four, and again, each one has their own reference bit. In the very beginning, the reference bit is set to zero. So let's say that some, some query accesses page one, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip its reference bit to one. And no matter how many times somebody accesses this, this page, it's always set to one, it's not a counter. So now, now I need to evict a page because I don't have any more space. So my clock hand is going to start with this first one. I see that its reference bit is set to one, and therefore it's been accessed, and therefore I should not evict it. But now I reset its reference bit to zero, and then go on to the, to the next one. And I'm going to sweep around. If I come back around and it's set to zero, then I know I, I can evict it. So this guy here, his bit is set to zero. So we can go ahead, evict it, remove it, and replace it with uh, a new page. And then we don't set its reference bit to one, we just set it to zero, and then move on to the next one. So let's say now page three and four have been accessed. So we check that, reset it to zero, check that, reset it to zero. Now we come back to the page one, which is the first one we checked. Its reference bit was zero since the last time we checked, so therefore it can be evicted. So again, reason why this is an approximation is because as I'm evicting pages, I'm not evic evicting exactly the one that's the most least, least recently used. It's, sort of a, 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 you know, it's just saying within some time window, these pages have not been used. And therefore, it's, it, there's, I, I, I can go ahead and evict them. And the intuition here is that if the page hasn't been used in a while, then it's probably not going to be used again in the, in, the, in the near future. So therefore, it's something I can go ahead and evict. Right. right? So that assumption works, a lot, works well for simple things, like doing point queries to go access single things. Both clock and LRU are susceptible to what is called sequential flooding. And what this means is that when we have a sequential scan that's going to read every single page, that's going to pollute our page cache, and that's going to end up having, uh, we could end up evicting pages that maybe we do really want, that are going to be used very, 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 uh, in, in the near future. But because that scan read a bunch of pages, all those pages are going to have uh, newer timestamps than, than the page I actually do want. Right? In this case here, the most recently page, uh, used page is actually the one I want to evict not the least recently used. So this is another good example where you, if you can have different buffer pool, different buffer pools or different tables based on how queries are gonna access them, maybe one I wanna use most recently used and another one I wanna use least recently used. So let's look at an example. Let's say I have one query that's doing a point lookup where, where, a equals, uh, where, where ID equals one and it, and it reads page zero. So I go ahead and fetch that into my buffer pool and I'm fine. So then now I have another query that's gonna do a sequential scan, so it's gonna rip through uh, all, my, uh, all my pages, 
And then when it wants to make space for page three, if again, if we're using least recently used, uh, then it would figure out that, oh, page zero is the least recently used. Let me go ahead and evict that and put in page three. But in my workload, I'm executing queries that look like the first one over and over again. So now if I execute this query all over again, now I read page zero, I just evicted it, and now I'm screwed because now I gotta go out and disk and get it. All right? So what I really what I should have done is, is evicted one or two because this scan is gonna go three go through and read more data, and it's unlikely that anybody else is gonna come and read this thing here. So the way there's three ways to get around this. We sort of covered some of these uh, 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 so far. So the first is to do uh, what's called LRUK. Where K is just you keep track of the number the 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 time the number of times multiple timestamps every single time this this page is accessed. So now when you want to say which which one should I remove, you don't look to see which one has the lowest timestamp. You go look at the intervals between those timestamps, and you say which one has the longest amount of time between one access to the next access, and then can use that to figure out which one's the least likely to be used. So this. Because we're using the history to, again, to estimate when it's going to be accessed again to make, help us make a better decision about what pages should be evicted. So LRUK is what's used in, uh, in, in, in it, the more sophisticated data systems will do something like this. I don't know. I think MySQL might use this. I, I, don't, I don't remember. All right, the next optimization we can do, which we sort of already talked about with uh, having multiple buffer pools, is to have localization per query. So rather than have that you know, as I'm scanning the table and putting it into the global buffer pool, if I have a small little uh, set aside some pages in the buffer pool that are specific to my query, anybody can still read them, but it's, it's I'm keeping track of how I'm using pages. So then, then when I want to make a decision on what to evict from my query, I evict the ones that are least recently used for me, not the global view. So we saw this in Postgres. Postgres had that hit memory show. The hit was like 32, then with the 64, right? That's this little ring buffer that, that they're keeping track of what pages that that query is accessing to make decisions what, what to evict. All right, the last one is to do priority hints. Again, this is where we talked about before. When we have, we have indexes, we know how they're scanning data, know, know what pages they're going to access. So we can use that information to make decisions about what to evict. So let's say we have our, our, our B plus tree or whatever tree data structure we want. And they have a bunch of queries that are going to insert data where there's a global counter for this table or just incrementing it by one and inserting over and over again, like a, a serial key or auto increment key. So if we're now sorted on, if this index is sorted on ID from min to max, we know that every single time we do an insert, the, the ID value is always going to be one more than the, the last one we just inserted. So that means we're always going to be going down the right side of the tree and touching these pages. So therefore, we should have hints up into the buffer pool manager and say, these pages should try to stay in memory. I don't care about these so much about these other ones here. Or likewise, if I have a query that does lookups on, on different IDs, uh, or any, actually any query that does a lookup on this index, I know I'm always going to be going through the root page because that's how I enter this index. I have to go through that. So therefore, I want to make sure that's always pinned in memory. That, that always stays there. Because right, otherwise, if I, if, if, I get, if I get to the bottom and I, I need space and I evict this thing, that's a bad idea because that, you know, that, that's the least recently used, but I know that the next query is going to come through and go to the, exactly through that page. So again, this is what the commercial systems can do, provide this extra information up above. All right. The last thing to talk about is how do we actually handle dirty pages? So remember, there's a, there's a dirty bit on the page that says whether a Query has modified the contents of that page since the last time it, since, since, since it was brought into the buffer pool. So when we now make a decision on what page to evict to bring a new page in, the fastest thing we could do is just find a page that was, that's not marked dirty and immediately just drop it and you know, use its frame for a new buffer pool. The slower thing we'd have to do is if a page is, is dirty, we have to write it back out to disk safely before we can reuse that space for, for our new page. So now there's this trade-off we have to make in our replacement policy to decide, well, there's a bunch of pages that are all, all, that are all clean, and I could drop them super easily, but they actually may be needed in the near future, so I don't want to actually drop them. Instead, I want to pay the penalty to write out a dirty page, flush it, remove it from my buffer pool, and reuse its space. 
So how you actually balance them is, is super hard. Right, because again, I, I, in this case here, to do a, a disk read, if I had to write out a dirty page, it's two disk IOs. One IO to write out the dirty page, then remove it from the buffer pool, and then another IO to read the page that I want. In this case here, it's one IO to just, just go read the page that I want, because I can drop the, the page that's already in the buffer pool. So how you actually figure that out, again, is super hard, and this is what the commercial systems, in my opinion, do better than the open source ones. So a way to get around this, to avoid that, the, the problem of ha having to, uh, to write a page out as soon as I need a free space in my buffer pool, I can do background writing. So periodically, the data system is going to have a thread that's going to look through my buffer pool, figure out what pages are marked dirty, and just write them out to disk. And so that way, I can flip them to be marked as clean, and now when I have to run my replacement policy to decide what page to remove, I have a bunch of clean pages I, I, can, I can drop right away. So you got to be careful when you do this because you don't want to write out dirty pages before the log records that correspond to, the, to, the, to modifying them to make them dirty. You want to make sure they're, the log records are written out the disk first before you write out the dirty pages. We'll have a whole lecture on why that's the case later on in the semester. But just know that it's, like, it's not just like I can just blindly write any page I want. I have to do some extra steps and protections to make sure I'm writing things in the right order. And this is something that MMAP can, cannot do. All right, so I'm going to skip this uh, for the other memory pools. Just, we've already sort of covered this. It's more than just the pages from tables or indexes. There's, when we run queries, we also need it to generate some, some information. All right, so the, again, the, the whole point of this lecture was to talk about how we can manage memory better than the OS, because we know what queries are doing, we know what's in the pages, we know how things are being accessed, and we can make better decisions. And essentially, we're going to use information on what's in the query to, you know, for all these different things that we talked about. And there's a bunch of different optimizations we can apply to help us make this work better. All right, so any questions about buffer pool? All right, here's what you really care about. Project one, right? So the, uh, for the first project, you're going to be building your own uh, buffer pool manager and replacement policy. So this will all be done in our new database system called BusTub. Uh, which is it's an open source system. It's disk based. Again, it's you will see this. There'll be uh, stub files in the code that you would download from GitHub that will clearly show here's the functions you need to write and here's here's how to actually you know implement the, what we're asking you to do. So the project is, is the write up is available online. The grade scope isn't been set up yet. We'll do that later today. But if you can finish this project in a single day, come talk to me because we, we want you to do other things. Um, <laughs> So we are going to already provide you the disk manager and already the page layouts. So you don't have to worry about that. You just, we'll give you a page, a block, a block of pages, uh, and it's up for you to decide how to store them in memory and then and, and invoke the disk manager to write them out as needed. So for the first one, you're going to, you're, we have a separate class called Clock Replacer, and you'll be implementing the clock policy that I talked about here today. Again, it's an approximation of, uh, of LRU. We just sweep the hand and, and flip these reference, reference bits. So that means you need to keep track of um, as pages are being accessed, because you'll see this in the, in the buffer pool API, you have to know that when I say read a page or write a page, uh, that you go update the reference bit inside of your LRU replacer, or sorry, your, your clock replacer. So the one thing to be important to know is that if you do a sweep and all the pages have been uh, were, were modified, then you just pick whatever one has the lowest frame ID. Are there, if all the pages are pinned and you can't free one, then you pick one with the lowest page ID, right? Because otherwise you just spin forever. And this will be in the write-up. The major effort will be on the on the buffer pool manager. So you implement the clock replacer algorithm first, and then you hook that into your your buffer pool manager. And for this one, it's, again, it's up for you to decide how you actually want to maintain your memory, how you decide what internal data structures you want to keep track of, what, what pages that are available, what pages are 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 dirty, what pages are are being pinned. Right? You can do whatever you want. It's just you have to implement the API that, that we expose to you. So it's been super, the thing that always tricks up students every year is to make sure you get the ordering of the operations of how to pin pages correct. Right? So we'll, we'll do multi-threading graded tests. We'll try to read a page and pin it at the same time. And you have to make sure that everything turns out in the right order. And th this will be more clear when you look at the write-up and see what we're asking you to do. So how to get started. So again, everything is available on, on GitHub. You want to go to your, if you don't have a GitHub account, sign up one. It's free. There's also, I think, an educational one that you get extra stuff. Um, but basically, you'll go to the GitHub page for the, for the, the, the database system, and there'll be a little fork button. You fork it into your private repo, 
uh, a fork into your own repo, mark it as private so nothing's public, uh, and then just do all your changes in there. Yeah, if you sign up for the GitHub account, you can get uh, free private forked repos, right? Because if you put everything public, then other students can see what you're doing and then potentially copy from you. Um, the very first thing you should try to do today or tomorrow as soon as possible will be super helpful. Try to get the, the software to build on your whatever machine you're going to do your development on. So it works on Ubuntu, it works on OS X, uh, it works on Windows with the Windows Server or Server Lite Linux, whatever this package you can download and install. Um, the thing though for OS X is not going to support the Clang formatting stuff that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so Gradescope will run this for you. You can run it in Docker if you, this is a problem. We can also give you a VM image, but you'll have to, you'll have to figure this out on your own. We'll, we'll have instructions to try to help this out. It does not compile on an Android machine. We tried it, it doesn't work. The, the, the software they have on there is too slow. If this is a problem, if you don't have your own laptop, please email me and we'll figure something out, okay? So, things to note. You should not change any file that, other than what you must hand in, because we're basically gonna blow everything away. There's four files you, you, you have to turn in. We blow everything else away and plop your code on top of the, the latest version of the, the system and run all your tests. The projects are accumulative, meaning if you bomb this one, you're gonna have problems later on because uh, you know, the next project is actually gonna use the buffer pool manager that you built today or build now. We're also not gonna be providing solutions at the beginning um, and then we're not gonna help you debug your code on Piazza. Another thing we're doing new this year is that we're requiring you to write good looking code. Normally people write shit code uh, and so now we have a bunch of checks to make sure it actually conforms to a good style guide. So we follow the Google C++ style guide and we also follow the Docs and Java Docs style guide. So we have checks already in place that will check all these things for you. Like if you call make format, it'll make sure your code looks pretty in, in the C++ style guide. But there's a bunch of other things like how you allocate memory, uh, how you set up your for loops and so forth that we use Clang Tidy and Clang Format to, to enforce uh, more, more detail. So you'll run these commands like check clang tidy, click check censored, check lint. It will throw errors. It won't correct it for you. It'll throw errors and say, your code looks crappy. Here's how to fix it. Okay? And we're going to run this in grade scope. So when you turn it in, if you write crappy code, it'll, you'll, get, you'll get a zero score because you'll, you'll fail these tests. And so this is what I'm saying. So Linux and Windows, I think this works. For OS X, I don't think this works. But again, we can provide you a VM. You can do all your development in there. Okay? Last thing, don't plagiarize. We will run your code through Moss. There's some, some people in China that take the code and have already implemented some stuff. Theirs is all crap, we've run it, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> don't make your stuff, again, don't put your stuff on the public repo because if, if I, we, we run your stuff and someone copies from you because your, your account was public, we run them Moss and you both come up as being duplicates of each other, I don't know who stole from who. Right, so you both are gonna fail, okay? So don't put any of your code public. You can do this in the end of the semester, because I know you want to go in the job market and be like, oh, here's what I did in this class. Truth be told, no one's actually going to care because everyone's implementing the same thing. It's not like an independent study where you, you, you make some break, good breakthrough. So employers, they don't care that much that you have your project online. But if you want to do it in the semester, we're fine with that. Okay? Any questions? Next, hash table. Hit it. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo In the mix of broken bottles and crushed up cans Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry It's with St. Nas in my system Crack another, I'm blessed Let's go get the next one and get over The object is to stay sober Lay on the sofa, better yet down my shoulder Who be the wild, I'll be stressed out Could never be son, Rick is a jelly Hit the deli for a cold one, naturally blessed Yes, my rap is like a laser beam The pawns in the bushes, St. Nas in the canteen Crack the bottle I love the same eye, sipping through gold. You don't realize the drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people still alive. And if the same don't know you from a can of paint, paint.